Cosmic Radio. It's GT221, 3418. Eater Bramble, Nard Spool and Dog Hardy all have Amber Alerts for Space Whales. A solar wind is causing delays coreward of Big Tom. Be aware of Quantum Moss east of the Shat. Now on Cosmic Radio, Joe and Jay answer your mining and exploration questions in Prospector's Question Time. Good galaxy, welcome to Prospector's Question Time with myself, Joe and Jay. Hello, Jay. Are you alright? Yes, I'm very well. You are always a positive man. This is, of course, so. Shall we get on and do something worthwhile that's helped some prospects? Yes, indeed. But first, I do have a question, which is, Sir, how do you divest yourself of a particularly heavy load of minerals? Particularly heavy load. I would, I would dump my load as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a like, you're not being serious, I It's play on words. I, it, it is indeed. It was a little joke to start. Because um, you could shoot it into a willing body. Uh, you should. You could shoot it into a into a astral body, into a willing body. You you would advise shooting your load, a particularly heavy load, into an astral body. I, yeah, I would. Even, but it's against doctrine, isn't it? Yes, it is. Now, joke over. Let's begin. He that besmircheth uh, the cosmos besmircheth. Me. That's true. That's very good. I wouldn't dump my load on you. No, no, not me. Big me. The big me. Yes, the big me out there in the galaxy. That's him. Yes. Oh, it's like talking to a Doxian. We're getting off topic anyway. Like we've ever got a topic. We have, sir. To answer the questions of those many prospectors out on the arm doing their good work. Doing their good work and keeping the lights on throughout civilized space. Yep, 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 yep. Those. Yeah, those people. So let's get on and answer this first question. This is from Terry the Hand. Oh, that's handy. Terry asks, what's the best way to transport Bognium? He goes on. Some people say a stasis field, others swear by biofoam. Perennial question, isn't it? It's one of those perennial questions. You be perennial. Do you have an answer? Yes, I have an answer. It's what's your budget? If, if Andromeda's the limit, I'd go for stasis. There's no downside to stasis. Apart from power drain. Right, okay, power drain, but... And the bleed off. Okay. You can't store anything within two metres of a decent stasis field, can you? Okay. Have you That's a lot of wasted capacity. Right. Apart from the power drain and the capacity, there's really radiation. no... Radiation. Frack off! I'm just <laughs> saying. Go for biofoam. Go for biofoam, then. Frack it. Biofoam it is. Quite right. That's what I thought from the beginning. And you're right, you're right. What can I say? Next question. Can't wait. Nancy Zero. Nancy Zero. That's an interesting name, isn't it? It's a kind of a new name. It's a new name. Nancy Zero. She's a, she takes zero shat. I wouldn't mess with her. Neither would I. But there is a wrinkle because we perhaps are not using the correct nomenclature for Nancy, traditionally female name. Let's see what Nancy has to say. Nancy Zero says, As a non-binar in the spiral arm, I am often faced with discrimination in the traditionally gendered business of prospecting. Any advice? They're on the edge of space and they're the, on the edge of what's expected, my friend. Well, I'd just say, hang in there. It sounds trite, but change takes time. This is true. This is true. Look at me. You think this was easy? Ladies and gentlemen, Jay is, of course, referring to his third eye. It's a very fetching eye. Thanks. I have come to terms with it. But it was not easy. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, but any difference is going to uh, effect. And we, we have been flip we're being somewhat flippant, I feel. Yeah. And we don't mean to be flippant. I remember the jokes in school whispered. They would whisper and they're just loud enough for you to hear. So they're not really whispers. Look, here comes the Cyclops, that kind of thing. Yes, that kind of thing. Uh, except that doesn't work, does it? Because a Cyclops only has one eye and I've got three eyes. 
hey, Blinky, pass me that fuel rod, that kind of thing. Yeah, that sort of thing. So all I'm saying is, hang in there. It's zero. Something about an insect. Because they've got lots of eyes. Next question. Right, next question. Oh, this is a good one. From Pony Jack. Dear Joe and Jay, love the show. Best prospecting show on the radio, says Jack. The only bloody prospecting show on the radio. Right? Who listens to radio? No one. Anyway, after due flattery, he continues, I was interested in you guys past in prospecting. How'd you end up on the radio and not out on the arm like us fools? Hopes you don't mind. He actually writes as he as he speaks. Hopes you don't mind me asking, but it gets lonely out here and you guys feel like sort of friends. I may be going nuts. Well, nuts is the name of the game out on the arm. Right, Jay? That's why I got out. I'm sure we've got over this before. It was a while ago, though. And people might not remember, or they might be new listeners. <laughs> new listeners. That, that's the that's a that's the best joke you've made all day. Thank you. Well, I got out because of transvestite, didn't I? To clarify, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. J is not referring to the uh, cross-dressing humanoid variety of transvestite. He's referring to the trans-dimensional ore that was discovered in 05. Right, well, it went and transformed on me, didn't it? One minute. I've got a cargo full of precious metal. The next it's a gang of talking lobsters and they were threatening to jettison the fuel reserve if I didn't recognise them as sentient. It's like health and safety, isn't it? True, very true. Not to mention you planet hoppers. I'm not surprised you got out of that lark. No hazard pay. For myself, I quit because... Adjusting. Ah, adjusting. She should have been allowed to migrate with her people as soon as Shagukor got wind of the planet, but uh, that was not to be. No, because you catalogued it, didn't you? There was Elysium on it. I did. I did. Uh, as far as I was concerned, there was plenty of time. It turned out there wasn't enough time and she stayed and martyred herself. Yes, but my point is, the life of a prospector is a difficult one. Nobody is going to argue with that. Well, on that bombshell, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our allotted time on Cosmic Radio. We hope you have found our advice useful in some way. I very much doubt it. So do I, from myself, Joe, and from Jay. Yep, that's me. Have a very good day, night, or other dimensionally time frame you are currently experiencing. And we will see you next time. Bye for now. Bye, see ya. Cosmic Radio, cutting the edge of space for content. What is this place? It is a room. What is a room? A room is a space within which there are things. That is a refrigeration unit. A refrigeration unit keeps biomatter cold. Low temperatures discourage the decay of biomatter, yet all biomatter decays eventually. This, this is so. That is a desk. A desk is an object for holding other objects. Yet the desk does not hold the objects. A desk is an object for resting other objects. On top of. Why? Because some objects require being closer. There are many desks. In this room they are everywhere. This, this is, is so. On the wall there is a view screen. View screens are for the imparting of information and entertainment. This robot wishes he was on a view screen. Why? So that he could tell others of his findings. This robot concurs. Soon we will have cataloged all things in this room. It would benefit others to know of them. How long have we been robots? This unit's internal chronometer indicates 1 minute and 13 seconds. It feels like longer. This robot should try the door. What is a door? A door leads to other places. This door is locked. Let us return to cataloging. There is a button on this desk. Buttons are for pressing. The button reads reset. Should this robot press it? Affirmative. 
Let us catalog the defects of the button. What is this place? It is a room. What is a room? A room is a space within which there are things. That is a refrigeration unit. A refrigeration unit means... I tell you what, you learn a few things when you've hauled freight across two-thirds of the spiral line. It's been my tenure, I'm a pilot, a prophet, I suppose, a proliferator of hope. Right, you know, to the struggling masses in this melting pot, gene-melded DNA we call the Milky Way. My name is Maximilian Stardrive and this is my maximum message. Believe in yourself, people. You might be people or pods. Any creed. I'm telling you, don't bend to those corporate slave drivers. It serves them to keep you down at heel and lacking hope. We are the lifeblood of this pitiable galaxy. Without us, the arteries of this economic organism we call civilization would seize up with the poisonous byproducts of a thousand shady deals. Perpetrated by unscrupulous space whales in their bourgeois castle ships and floating casinos. Maybe you've got a kid at home needs feeding, that's why you do it. Or you've got a spouse and she's waiting, he, she. Could be any reason, could be because you've got a chem toad waiting for you and needs feeding. I don't know, do I? My point is, we do this because we must. We do this for the ones we love. Or even if they've passed on like mine, you do it because you love the stars. You believe those bright islands on a canvas of black. They're the airplane of a dream. Connect them together and what have you got? It's the flipping future, isn't it? So keep trucking, people. Keep the good old galaxy turning. I've been Maximilian Stardrive. And this has been my maximum message for today. Are you tired of the same old scale? Try new green scale. All the taste of blue scale, but looks a bit like nature. Cosmic Radio. Intelligent speech in any dimension. And now on Cosmic Radio, Professor San Juan Hitachi discusses a much misunderstood race in Xenobiology Today. Good galaxy, welcome to Xenobiology Today. Slugamundus Adaptus, that is the topic for today. It is one of the most populous races in the known space, with their rich history, culture, and impenetrable language, the latter only understandable after years of study by the most anal of linguists. Yet they are still considered extra humanoid by most to be tolerated only for the trillions in revenue generated in their slim trade, that hallucinogenic poison imbibed by countless idiots. Colloquially known as slug pods, a reference to the hard snot-like structures from which they hatch, they are believed to have originated on a planet covered of the silly stars band. Their precise origin point has proven difficult to ascertain, given the incredible spread of this offensive species and the fact that slug pods are notoriously annoying to talk to. They hardly ever say what they mean, and when they do, it's usually some rubbish be 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 destined to rule the galaxy. However, the study of one slug pod in particular has begun to challenge preconceived notions. The subject in question, known as Percy, he has been held at the Institute for Extrahumanoid Studies at the University of Ganymede for the past 16 years. Among the many amazing feats Percy has achieved is a rudimentary understanding of galactic basic. He can now order a sandwich, for instance, and converse quite fluently about politics. At the Big Planet Expo in 2416, Percy wowed crowds by reciting the Terran National Anthem. Let's listen to an excerpt. Hello. 
but it is misplaced. We will see us as long, but let the tail and they should be always on it, suppose. Let the money all in races our expansion scrubber. Fear not for to plant the flag in the alien soil. Let the mongers do the same and smart it for us all. Slug boats are, for better or for worse, part of galactic life. They may be aggressive, hard to understand, and lacking in common decency, but to dismiss them would be a mistake, I say. Let us not forget that had the precursors dismissed humanoid life, we would not now be afforded the opportunity to forge our own great destiny. The great Terran destiny to go out into the galaxy and search for new things to buy. I have been Professor Sanwan Hitachi, and you have been listening to Xenobiology Today. People bring all kinds of things back from the edge of space. Some of it legal, some of it not. A corpse was nothing special, but the corpse of Nelson Nugent the famed explorer and movie producer was a surprise even to Larry Sticklevich, the Matari Gateway's number one customs agent. Stand back, people, there's nothing to see here, said Larry, dropping to one knee next to the whitish blue face of Nugent's former body. Ah! Larry winced and switched to his other knee. He vaguely recalled that Nugent had been location scouting for a movie, Space Race to the Edge of Beyond and back, when reports had come in that his ship had been attacked by Atlantean pirates. The corpse next to Larry's one good knee seemed to confirm this, but why it had rocked up now in the possession of some low-life prospector on his way back from the spiral arm? That was the question. Right, first things first, said Larry, in the officious tone he cultivated over the years for just such an occasion. Let's see your passports and the full ship's manifest. Maybe, a chipper voice interrupted, they should set up a cordon. This was Mitch Greenway, rookie, wet as they come, and far too eager to take action in Larry's opinion. Action should only ever be taken after a hefty dose of due process. Just check the papers, kid. But what if... Listen, Larry cut him off. I didn't get to where I am today by rushing in where slugpots fear to dread. You know what that'll get you? A whole heap of confusion, that's what. First, let's figure out who everyone is and whether they're entitled to be here and what they've got with them and whether it's legal. And then, and only then, will we set up any kind of cordon, all right? Mitch nodded, his cheeks reddening with embarrassment. Larry didn't like to dress anyone down in public, but with all the paperwork they were likely to be dealing with, there was no time to mince words. I'd say he's here. He stopped off in Rigel, said Larry to the freighter captain, on whose ship the corpse had been discovered. As space rats go, he was pretty well turned out, but Larry caught something in his eye. What is that? It's nothing. The skipper blinked nervously. It's just my ocular implant. It looks expensive, that's all. Yeah, well, been a good trip, hasn't it? I can see that. That coat you're wearing is real plaxian bugbear hide by the looks of it. Nah, it's fake, the skipper attempted. All right, well, everything seems to be in order here, Larry chimed brightly. Mitch gave him a worried look, but he chose to ignore it. Apart from the question of the dead body, of course. Right, right, well, we was told to bring it back, see? Right. Why, who would that be then? Oh, uh, well, we never met the bloke. Just took delivery. Never even knew it was a body till now. We'd have kept it further away from the marshmallows if we'd known. Health and safety, isn't it? All they gave us was this data slip for the authorities. Right, well, I should have that then, shouldn't I? I'm an authority. Thank you. Larry swiped the data slip and a brief message appeared. His brow furrowed, but he quickly tried to hide his apprehension. Like I said, everything's fine. This doesn't change anything. So, as long as you're not leaving today, you're not leaving today, are you? The skipper shook his head, his legs already in motion towards the exit. Mitch thought he heard the word piss off, but thought better of relaying this to Larry. You look concerned, Officer Greenway. Well, there are plenty of ships coming and going. They could scarper. And why would they do that? You mean, you believe their story? Larry stepped out of the way as two men from the coroner's office arrived with a baggie for the body. You get a nose for these things over time, kid. Just freighter guys, that's all they are. 
It's the name on this data slip that has me worried. Oh yeah, Mitch brightened. Larry couldn't help but smile. He remembered the days when he'd pursued any hint of excitement and adventure with reckless abandon. That was before he realised that for every hour of action, there was a week spent writing reports about it. But you can't be taught stuff like that, Larry knew. You have to learn it for yourself. And Mitch would be learning soon enough, Larry suspected, if the person named on this data slip came to collect the body. She was a walking disaster area, as far as Larry was concerned. A vacuous, fame-hungry, egotistical lunatic. What's the name, then? Mitch asked. Jane Bloody Draper, Larry intoned. Oh! 